be a part of the operational staff of the Chagrin Doc Fest. So thank you, uh, Sarah, Marianne, for asking me. It's been a blast. And you're here uh, for a film panel, which I believe will, it's here in person, of course, but also I think you could be watching it over the web. So thank you, everybody who's watching. Um, so at this time, please uh, tell us your names and, and tell us what film you're with. Uh, my name is Matthew Bauer. I am the director of The Other Fellow, uh, which is about the lives of real men around the world named James Bond. I'm Josh Lawhorn. I was the editor for Culture Fix Clee. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Wasserman, and I was the director producer of Culture Fix Clee, which is a short uh, being seen tomorrow at 3.15 at the theater, Little Theater. And it's uh, essentially a story about a street artist in Tel Aviv named Day Day. And uh, he uh, realized during the time of the pandemic that all of these different types of artists in Israel needed to be healed. And he has a signature in his art with Band-Aids. And it's a story about that and then him coming to Cleveland. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Turner. And I made a film called Monument about a uh, Holocaust memorial that my k k grandma made in Hungary. Hi, my name is Sam Watkins. Uh, my film is The uh, Vanishing Strings of the Andes, which is about uh, the struggle that Ecuadorian guitar makers uh, face to continue their craft. And it's on today at 2 p.m. in the Valley Arts Center. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I want to first ask, all of us, of course, we're filmmakers, why is, what is it about documentary filmmaking specifically that drew you to that specific genre? You know, I, I think a lot of people have aspirations to be Steven Spielberg, but I think there's, there's a special breed of us uh, <laughs> who thrive in the documentary world. What, uh, what was it about documentary filmmaking that drew you to that? To be perfectly honest, I was the same. I was looking at narrative and then it just happened that this idea I had for a film was a documentary. Um, and so that sort of ended up being what I went into. And now I can't imagine doing anything else. I think once you've done documentary, the idea of like starting on a blank page and being like, you know, interior night, day, man walks into apartment just feels completely alien um, once you've worked with real people. And I've, I've grown to love the genre because it's like slowly sculpting something out of a block of marble and you can keep chipping away with it until you're happy, which I really like about documentary. I think um, documentaries, A, it's the honesty about them. You know, narratives are great, and some people would say they're the cream of the crop, but they're not necessarily, you know, honest, and they, they try to make you, I mean, every movie tries to make you feel an emotion. Um, also, I think documentaries, they can be made cheaply, and it seems like an obtainable goal. Uh, most of my background has been in uh, theater or television, PBS specials that were not documentaries. Um, but working on documentaries, I find that it gives you an opportunity uh, to tell not only what is the want, but also what is the what you don't want. So in a character or the storyline of your documentary, everyone usually, it's easy to see, what do they want? What is their goal? What are they trying to do? But I think you have an opportunity to better show what is it that they're not wanting. And that's what I love about documentaries is if you look at it from the perspective from the opposite way, uh, documentaries are a wonderful vehicle for obtaining that um, uh, challenge. Um. I've, I've kind of always felt like I have a weird flaw in my personality where like making something f fictional or even about someone else is totally uninteresting to me. Like I feel like films are kind of my form of self-therapy in a way and they often take like five years or more to make and so they're just kind of a chapter of 
of life, just like a home movie. I've always loved home movies, you know, like seeing the movies that my mom shot in the 90s of like me and my brother just on a certain day with like light in a certain way. It's just like a feeling that you just can't really replicate, even as we've been seeing narrative kind of take like t the documentary aesthetic more and more to try and give authenticity to, the, to their projects, even like Barbie had that scene at the end that incorporates that, which I thought was cool, but um, I feel like the real future of film that I hope is like more autobiographical, um, nonfiction. I feel like that genre is so underserved in film and is really like the most exciting place to like push forward. I think my thoughts probably echo a lot of what's already been said so far on stage about authenticity, about the truth of it. And I think just to add to that, I would say uh, modern narrative cinema can be, like especially blockbuster movies, can be a little bit sterile. Um, I don't want to cast any more stones at the Marvel franchise has already been cast so far. But there is a certain essence when you watch those movies, and they're, they're entertaining popcorn movies, but when you watch a documentary, it's a real person, you know, it's real people's lives. And you have an opportunity, however small or large, to help make some people's lives better. I mean, I can give an example from my film when uh, people have watched my film and actually said they're going to go to this guitar road, help buy guitars there, and help support these people that are in need. And that's a really, you know, really important uh, feeling, I think. And it's... It's it's really making a little bit of a difference, you know, whether it's small or big. Um, I think that's that's really important today. Well, I'm so sorry. I'm late. I'm never late. It's so rude. It's because I left. I was calling my children and my mother in uh, all over the world just to say how grateful I am for the award. So I don't know the question. So I have no idea what I'm supposed to. I'm so sorry. World goes on. Okay, well, my name is Harriet Marin Jones. Uh, I come from Paris, and my film is King of Kings. And uh, I come from the fiction. I did a bunch of short films and a feature film. But there was no way I was going to do this film as a fiction, even though it could be a fiction because the story is so crazy. Uh, but I thought I would do a documentary, so I would have the real people. I wanted to really show the truth, what it was like with real people in, uh, that incarnate the, the truth. And uh, it was uh, a whole quest. It was an investigation. And it wouldn't have been the same if it had been fiction or a series, which might come afterwards. But documentary really is a mean, which I think is absolutely amazing to learn and to transmit. So that was the goal behind it. So people would come out, perhaps, and it would make a tiny difference in their lives that they would have perhaps learned something that they didn't know. That's it. Well, and we, we are fortunate to have some award winners from earlier. So let's give a round of applause to, uh, to King of Kings and also Monuments. Um, that was good planning on whoever's uh, part <laughs> for that. Um, but uh, what I what I want to know is, you know, sometimes the undertaking of a documentary, sometimes you're going to be in it for the long haul. What was it um, about, or, or what drew you to the subject um, for your individual films? Um, yeah, it's a good question, really. I, I did a lot of kind of visual art projects before I went into documentary and they were often like a sculpture that took three years to make, if you know what I mean. And I, I'm just, I'm not one of those person that can do 10 different things. I just become completely fixated on one thing for a number of years. Um, and I just have a thing, it just comes into my head and I immediately know that's like, that's it. And I think sometimes you just, when you have that idea and you know that's it, you just go for it, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not really a very thought out process for me, it just sort of happens. Um. In my case, um, there is an organization here in Cleveland called the Cleveland Israel Arts Connection, 
and it's a part of the Jewish Federation of Cleveland. And for, I, ironically, I think it's 14 years, they've been, their goal is to bring over artists from Israel here to the United States and to present them for bridging the gap between um, uh, the arts of all sorts, like the, uh, theater productions, dance productions, uh, symphonies, uh, you name it, anything in the arts. And uh, so when uh, they, uh, someone was in Tel Aviv and they saw Day Day's work and his uh, girlfriend, Nitzan, and her, she's also a street artist, and uh, how he could only work at night and how he is now to this day anonymous because it was against the law to do this, but now it's acceptable. It went from graffiti to being street art, so now it's acceptable and very popular. So they brought him over, so they realized they had never recorded or presented all of these amazing people. So they approached me and asked me if I wanted to do um, a program on this and follow his art throughout the city of Cleveland, his process. And so from that, I have learned about his story and put that into it as why he would was doing these Band-Aids. So, um, he had um, post-traumatic syndrome from being uh, in uh, the Israeli army and turned to his art of drawing these Band-Aids and then that led to helping all these people during the pandemic that were in the arts to have help them heal and help society heal. So they th thought that this was a wonderful story to bring over here and show how we all are the same but we can heal through artistic endeavors. Sounds really cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Tomorrow okay. at 315, cool. down the street. Um. Could you say the question one more time, Mike? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was like totally just engrossed yeah. in your story. Uh, what, uh, what drew you to the subject? Okay. Yeah, and I was really, I guess, trying to put the person's story, but mm. what, what drew you to take on this story? Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've only made two feature documentaries. The first one was about stuttering, and this one about my grandma's experience in the Holocaust and, like, my own relationship to it. And I feel like both those things, like, stuttering and kind of growing up uh, with, like, the Holocaust, always, like, kind of in the shadow of our family, were really two things that I think shaped my personality and who I am now and um, it was it was just really cool to have the opportunity to ex explore those things like the um, you know like documentary features take such a long time and um, it has to, and it's like you could make something you don't really care about that much or you can make something you really care about like they're both equally challenging to make, to find like the architecture of your story. Um, like I had gone to Hungary to just shoot like a movie about my c c grandma and it was only after coming back that it was like, oh, this is called Monument. Like the thing is th the monument, this like container for stories um, that like I was making and that my c c c grandma had left for me. Um, and yeah, it just, it's, it's just really cool how these projects can kind of start to just pull in like every th thread of your life that's happening. Like for me, it was like parenthood and feeling scared for the future and like what was happening during those years with like the Tree of Life shooting and all these things. And um, everything kind of got pulled into this one big project, this kind of big container. And I, th and I think the hard part is just finding like a container that can like hold all these elements. Um, for me, I think one of the key things that drew me to this documentary, uh, or this, this particular subject, was the fact that I myself am a guitarist, so I was already interested in this. And I'd read an article online, and this article didn't have a huge amount of information. There was one blurry picture that was along with it, and it was of this, uh, uh, this guitar maker who features in the documentary, Jose, in his uh, workshop. And 
it was kind of it fascinated me because I l researched for it online and I couldn't find much information about what they were doing there and what really was going on. And I was looking to make a short doc at the time, and I thought, yes, this is it. This is going to be really exciting for me. And I did some research online, and I found a guide in the area. And I said, listen, is there any way you can help me get in contact with these people? And he said, well, I'm not sure about that, but I know someone who might know someone who might know someone who might know someone who might know someone, and they knew the guitar people. So it was really, uh, you know, a fantastic sort of uh, uh, human network, you know, that led me to this. And that's particularly what attracted me, not only because I was a guitarist, but also as well, it was going to disappear, you know, and there wasn't a lot of information recorded about this. So I hope that at the very least, their story has now been captured on film so it can be, can be preserved for the future. Well, uh, it's the story of my grandfather, and uh, it was an untold story within my family, but also within the US, if I may. And so I was really trying to understand why my mother kept this story totally quiet, and uh, why we were, I think, an amazing family, but completely dysfunctional and very neurotic. And so I wanted to understand what was the secret behind. There is an expression in French which says the fantôme dans le placard, basically that you have ghosts in the closets. And uh, my children are French and I really wanted them to know that they have Amer African American heritage. And by digging into my own story, I found out such amazing things about my grandfather and the policy kings, it goes way beyond the story of my family. It really tells part of a US history. I think that very little people know that behind the lottery, it's African Americans. Very people know that the government let the mob, the mafia take over because of discrimination. They didn't want African Americans to be behind. So all this was absolutely blow mining for me. And uh, so I started pulling a thread, like every filmmaker here, and the more you pull the thread and the more you find out things, and you really feel that it's, you need to share that so the people uh, know, because they should know, they should know their own history. <laughs> so I think some of you have kind of hinted at this, but oftentimes, we hear from documentary filmmakers that it sometimes can be a lengthy process. What would you say for each of your films was the, from the time of conception to finishing it in the can, um, was the length of A process that maybe would be a narrative or something that, uh, working with PBS, that they have deadlines. And working in TV, you really have deadlines, so you have to get it done. And uh, Josh was great to work with because he's very adaptable uh, to any changes. And of course, there's always changes. But finally, you have to say, this is it. I don't know, but I'm going to go with it. And, and, and uh, as I think many times you think afterwards, oh, I could have this, I could have that, I should have this, I should have that. But just run with it and believe in yourself and believe in, in the people, the great people that you work with, such as Josh. So uh, it, this particular one is short, so that helped budget-wise and that also helped time-wise because we wanted to start to get the message out. Um, for Monument, we are, um, ever since my grandma died in 2010. It was really like, man, I would like to do a movie ab uh, about her. And then it was after the Tree of Life shooting in October of 2017 that really started like putting notes on paper, writing about things um, that seemed important and urgent to me at the time. And then like at the end of 2000. 19, we started making a plan to go to shoot this thing in the spring of 2020, and then everything got canceled. So then we kind of, or er, yeah, canceled. Um, and then, so it, it took a little bit longer, maybe four years to being like, we're gonna make this movie. 
to actually being here right now, showing it for the first time. Um, and, but I think having that extra time, and I think part of what interested me in the subject was that like monuments were like a totally obscure topic that no one thought about. And then in 2020, like everything changed. And so just having that opportunity to like sit with the subject and see what was unfolding in our country was really um, helpful and kind of changed the movie. And then we basically had to sneak into Hungary during COVID to shoot. Um, but that's like another story. But um, yeah, so about four years. Um, so for me, it was about, it started in February 2022 is when the idea first came about. Well, I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm going to do this now. And uh, things moved pretty quickly after that. It took about two months and I found myself out in uh, Ecuador in the mountains, uh, in over my head, um, a little bit nervous trying to direct in English and Spanish. Um, which was a, a serious challenge, but um, we got some great footage. It was only a couple of days shooting, and I came back, and I had all of this footage on a hard drive, and I thought, oh, I'll knock this out in two months. A year later, it still wasn't done. <laughs> so I said to myself, I really have to get this done. And it's not like I hadn't been doing, doing work during that time. I'd had to do commercial work. I'd had to do all of these sorts of different things, like get it transcribed um, into Spanish and then get it translated as well, because my Spanish had been good enough to interview them, but it hadn't been good enough to get every little nuance and every little bit needed. Um, and so I said, right, I need to give myself a deadline. And I'd say that that's something I think that's is I guess a little bit forgotten because when you're doing commercial projects you are given a deadline but when you're doing your own one you must enforce it otherwise it's just going to go and I knew that chagrin was coming up and I was like I really have to get this in because otherwise there's going to be no chance so yeah, it was probably about a year from start to finish it if I had been if I had known the things I knew now it probably should have taken a couple of months but I'm still really pleased with how it's uh, how it's turned out and I'm really pleased that it's uh, it actually was lucky enough to win an award at one of the previous festivals yeah so really pleased with that well uh, it took me over 10 years to do this considering the fact that I stopped and started again over like many filmmakers basically you have to work you make money. I tried to get a lot of grants. I didn't get any. In France, they would tell me it's an American topic. In the US, I would try to send the film, etc. I never managed to do anything. So at one point, I said, OK, I've got to do it myself. So I launched online courses, and that's how I financed the film. But it took me a very long time. I was sleeping four hours per night for a year and a half. But it doesn't matter. Uh, what counts is to get it done, to stop waiting and just uh, do it. So if I put it together between the time I started thinking and writing, it's over 10 years, but really to actually doing it, uh, probably a year and a half or something like that. I changed editors. Uh, someone proposed to put a lot of money into the film, but they wanted to do another film, and there was no way I was going to go that way, so I refused. So I did a crowdfunding, but that helped a little, but not much. But uh, actually, with perseverance, like everyone else who is here on this panel, you managed to do it. And uh, it's a great adventure because actually the film in itself, but it's also the making of the film, which is interesting because you find out so much of yourself. When you do a feature film, the script is written. When you get in the editing, you just follow the script. It's really easy. You have three months of editing. Here you can rewrite the film in the editing. You can go in different directions. It's very stimulating intellectually. You can also get lost and drown in all these options. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> well, kind of, kind of jumping off that, um, what was, uh, what was the most challenging uh, part of of making each of your films? Um, yeah, it's a bit of a personal answer for me. I went through a lot of personal challenges making this film, and I think, you know, you've always got to remember when you see a film. Often, people have gone th like to hell and back. Um, making it, I kind of fell into like a cycle of drug addiction kind of about halfway through 
my film and it was like the film wasn't coming together um, you know and that drug was the most common and deadly drug on earth which is alcohol um, and yeah I, I think it was very connected to the fact I couldn't get my film finished um, and I actually had one night where I was out drinking with the equipment for the film uh, which ended up with me getting robbed uh, and the hard drives for the, in, containing the entire footage uh, was stolen that night and when when they say to you, always keep backups, always keep backups, because you never know what will happen to your footage, and thankfully I still had those, um, but I got sober about halfway through making this film, um, and I credit that with getting it done. It definitely wouldn't have got done um, without that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I went through a lot kind of getting this film done, and I'm sure a lot of people on this panel um, you know, understand there's a lot of, <laughs> There's a lot of broken marriages and things that happen in the process of getting a film on the screen. And I think whenever you see a film, no matter how good or bad it is, you always have to respect the filmmakers for, for doing it because it can be a, bit, a very hard, thankless job sort of sometimes getting it there. I would say um, making the film was a dream. Uh, the hardest part about finishing it was actually the credits because I did uh, like this crazy animation sequence with a bunch of band-aids um, and there was a <laughs> there was a lot of uh, reordering of the credits and who goes where and uh, I, yeah so that was the hardest part and that was the hardest part because you don't want to leave anyone out you want to be double check and then check again everyone that was involved from site surveys to hospitality, every aspect of it, we didn't want to leave anyone out. And then you look through it and you know you have to double check that, which isn't the, isn't the most fun in making a film. Like, and then, oh, somebody go, well, where's so-and-so? They did such and such. And so then, you, then Josh had to go back and add them into the credits, which was okay. But like I said, we have to you know, finalize it. And are you sure? Is there anybody else? Um, which just was logistical stuff. But as far as any of the creative um, uh, vision I had in the beginning, because there's so many artists here, uh, I have to say that may, what I feel in any project that makes it enjoyable, which makes it um, thrilling, which then makes it, I think, a better project, is who you work with. If you're working with people who uh, get it as you do, then I think it's a lot easier. And if you're compatible and they're able to, if they listen and you listen, that, that camaraderie that I think is so needed for making a film or probably doing anything, but a film in particular, is highly important that you can see eye to eye and respect the other person. And I think that spurs your uh, making of the film to completion and then of course to presentation, which is we want everyone to see what we have to say. Um, <clears throat> you know what you mentioned, Matt? It's close to home. Thanks for sharing that. Like I went on the anti-depressants during the making of Monument just because being immersed in like Holocaust history during the Trump years I think was like a very like bleak um, field of study, so to speak. Um, and I would often like talk to the people that I knew who worked at like the Jewish Museum in Oregon or just different other places, you know, I like I met a lot of people who were making similar projects. I was like, how do you guys like go to sleep at night and have like a normal life with your family and stuff like doing this kind of work? Um, but, you know, like I would um, light a candle every day for my grandma before editing and um, just feeling her there and it, it made it like, easier and just being with my family was awesome. And uh, yeah, it's like hard, it can be hard to make something about a challenging subject and I think like a lot of these films probably deal with pretty intense uh, human interest stories. 
So we have to find ways to take care of ourselves too, and that can be challenging. Oh, some really, some really deep, fantastic themes I've heard so far from people. Um, whilst my film was uh, perhaps not dealing with as challenging themes, there was its own set of challenges because this is my first film, and like the confident person I am, I decided yeah, I can direct in my second language. No problem, you know. How wrong I was. Um, it was really rewarding to do it, and I'm really pleased with the result, but it certainly added time to the project doing that because, first of all, when I got back and I was looking at the footage, I had four hours of interviews to get down to 11, 15 minutes, which took time. Not only, I'd been learning Spanish for about four years by this point, just to give you some context, and what I found is that even though I could understand bits of it, I couldn't get the subtle nuances that you really look for as a filmmaker and the bits that really make your documentary. So I had to get a transcriber to go through this process that I've mentioned before. And that was certainly very challenging and added extra, uh, uh, extra, extra effort to the project, but really, really rewarding in the end, I have to say. Um, well, doing a film is a real roller coaster, of course, and you meet so many challenges. But the idea is to transform those challenges and uh, make it strengths. Me, I know it was my first documentary, and I worked with different uh, editors. Uh, two of them had much more experience than I had, and they would tell me, you can do this, you can do that. And one of the challenges is really to follow your vision. Even if people tell you, no, you're not allowed to, you're not supposed to, etc. If you really feel strongly about it, and me, I'm someone who doubts all the time. It's never good enough, whatever, you know, it's like we can do better. And I don't know, perfectionist, it's so bad, but you know, I did all the drawings, threw everything in the garbage, started again, did a first rough cut, threw everything again, started it again, you know, until you get it right. You're trying to look for music in your head until it's right. And when I see my film again, I'm still saying, oh, can I could cut this, I could still do this, etc. But at one point you must stop, so that's one of the challenges. And the other challenge that's very personal, it's to get my mother to talk. She never spoke for so many years, so to get her to sit down and finally tell the truth was a true challenge, because uh, you know, when you're in the no in the untold thing, so that was interesting, okay. I have like one or two more questions and I want to throw it out to the audience soon. So get any questions you might have ready. Um, so, you know, you've gone through all the challenges, you've gone through the, the whole production. Now, you know, this somewhat comes the fun part where you get to share it with audiences. What are some of the things that, um, that you have uh, experienced uh, when showing your film to the audience? Like, you know, how does it, uh, you know, the, the reward probably pays off, right? Yeah, this is my favorite part of all this and kind of on what we've just been talking about, I think the reason I enjoy it so much is because I get to work whilst I have a film that is finished. And most of the time the work is on an unfinished project and actually just having it done and all you've got to do is send the file to a film festival, that's easy compared to a lot of what comes before. Um, but yeah, I love watching my film with audiences. It's great hearing how they react to it. Um, I love it when some of my cast or people involved with the film actually get to come and see it. Uh, yeah, on, on, on a big screen. And you know, one of my cast members was like in tears watching it the other night and <laughs> might have been the martini he'd had beforehand. But it, it, it yeah, I, I, I love, and just the travel of this part and all that kind of thing. This, this is the fun part, um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to start a new film at the moment and I certainly have some apprehension about doing that, and so I'm trying to procrastinate for as long as possible with film festivals <laughs> until that happens. The thing I love the most about showing a film is did I, in the editing process, did I create the proper emotion in the audience's mind? And it's very fulfilling when you do create the, the right emotion. It's kind of soul crushing when you don't get the reaction that you wanted but um i kind of look at this like i'm a puppeteer and the audience i know this is terrible to say but like 
am I able to make my puppets do what I want them to do? <laughs> I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> uh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's like when you get to share the film now. Oh, share the film. You know, what, what, that, that's like the fun part, you know. So, you know, oh, okay. what, what do you take from sharing it yourself? It is the fun part, and it's uh, exhilarating many times. Um, but I think it's good for the soul to do that. I think it's good for us all to, whether we're filmmakers or theater makers or uh, just want to be able to express and show what we would like everyone else to know. And so that's what we do. And um, I was just having a discussion with someone about how, look at all of these wonderful documentaries. I didn't know anything about the whales or Amanda. I didn't know about this. We learn from that. But we learn in a way that is also enjoyable. And therefore, I think we, because it can be enjoyable or it can be um, heartbreakingly enlightening, that we are all, as viewers, better for it. So then therefore, if you have been the filmmaker, you know that or you feel that, and what more could you ask for? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't really like watching my movies with an audience. Um, it's not a pleasant experience for me. My body shakes a lot and <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, f um, but I, but I mean, even the uh, award that I got today is like so meaningful, just because I like want with my whole heart for my grandma's story to be passed on, and um, I, yeah, I feel so proud of her and really wanting people to be like invested in her and know her name and for my daughter to know what happened, um, but yeah, I feel like the experience of, um, yeah, I just want to make another movie, <laughs> so thank you for having me, though. This is, this is awesome. I think it's the most gratifying part is when you get to share the movie with people and get to see their reaction with it because as filmmakers, we all have you know these high hopes. We're like, let's hope we can make things a bit better for people, and especially for the subjects, you know, of your documentaries generally. And that's something that to me has always been really exciting. And I think I'm uh, similar to you in a way sometimes. That the first time I screen a documentary for an audience, I'm nervous. Like I don't know what it's going to be like. And I've been so close to this thing for so long. I've watched it 200 times. I don't know where it's good, where it's not so good, you know? And it's really gratifying to get to listen to people and get to hear them say, yes, we're, we're so pleased with that. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things I received was a little message on Instagram from the, uh, the cameraman's uh, wife who had shared the documentary with a bunch of people that she knew. And they said, we're going to go to Ecuador and we're going to buy some of these guitars and really help support the future of this thing. And to know that you have really played a part in making that little thing uh, potentially preserve this and help continue this, that's really, really special. Yeah, definitely. It's the most amazing things to work on something, to have an idea in your head, and to finally share it with the public, and to see if I didn't have a producer since I produced it myself. So I was talking with myself. It's sort of schizophrenic at one point, and to see that uh, uh, the audience—I don't know if the, it's not the right word—gets it, but that they. They appreciate the work, they learn something about it, that all the work and passion and love you've put into it is there and uh, it, it, it doesn't belong to you anymore, it belongs to them. It's a very strange feeling. And uh, it's fabulous when I, uh, me each time my heart is pounding, is it, are they gonna like it? Are they gonna, uh, are they gonna walk out of the movie theater? Are they? Uh, when I showed it in Chicago, for instance, people came up to me, someone who must have been like 100 years old, 
And uh, that man took me in the abs and said, I met your grandfather, I used to play the numbers, etc. Oh, it's amazing, you know? As a filmmaker, we all had that. Uh, if uh, the audience uh, take on your work, which can be very solitary, even though it's a collective work, and the teamwork is so important. My film wouldn't be the same without Philip Kelly behind the music, Christian Volkman behind the animated sequences, etc. I mean, we don't do this alone, that's for sure. But the public is really the reason why we do all this. All right, so I want to take this time now and uh, throw it out to our audience. If anybody has any questions, we do have a microphone right there if you want to. Oh, never mind. We have a, a wireless mic, so go ahead. Hi. If you could go back in time and do the same documentary but change one thing, what would that be? It's a really good question. Honestly, I wouldn't change anything. I, I really wouldn't. I, I, I'm happy with where the journey of the film ended up, and I think all of those highs and lows gets you there in the end. And I wouldn't want to mess with that by taking or adding anything, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think the one thing possible uh, would be, this is a short, I think it could still, it should still constitute being a short, but uh, like anything, there's just so much and you learn so much more uh, and you want to tell more. And uh, I think sometimes, unfortunately, documentaries start to repeat themselves and they're too long and you, look, you take the potential of losing your audience by doing that. But that being said, I probably would have loved to have had a, a little bit more in it, but I, I wanted to keep it um, maybe under, I don't know, what did I say? First I said eight minutes, and then we went up to about 10 or tw 12, and we ended up around there. So I think just to, to uh, tell more of the story, to have it just be a little bit longer. But I do think that we did establish the story within itself. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. I think, um, you know, the best moments are never filmed. You know, the camera, you turn it off and then someone says something to you. Um, we had some moments like that for sure. There's like one interview I really wish we had filmed, but you know, like, but I think in like a couple of years it'll just all dissolve and this thing that's left is like hopefully cool for people to see yeah that's a great question um one thing that i would change i think it's probably in a similar vein to, to what you said is that um we were in a, an interview with one of the protagonists in my documentary and uh, I asked him a question, and he gave me this fantastic answer. I was over the moon. I'm like, this? This is gold, you know? And um, then the sound man taps me on the shoulder and says, um, perdón, la batería no se funciona. And I was like, no. And he was saying to me, you know, the battery is out in my pack. I need to change it. And I'm like, oh, dear. <laughs> so he changed the battery, put a new one in. We start again. And I turn to my contributor, and I say, um, Gabriel, could you please say that exactly word for word what you said before? And he said, sí, hombre, no problema. He's like, you know, no problem, I'll do that. And he said something completely different that was nowhere near as good. So I would probably, that would be one thing I would change is I would probably, I'm not sure how you can do that because, you know, you don't, you don't know those things sometimes and sometimes they creep up on you because, you know, your equipment might have a little issue. You, you, you can't be sure of it. Um, but if I had the power of God, that's definitely something that I would change. Well, um, I really, really tried to get Michelle Obama to do an interview. Timuel Black, who's in the film, who passed last year at 103 years old, uh, was really helped the Obamas become, um, Barack Obama become senator. He helped the campaign, then president, etc. 
I had different connections to try to get to her because she's from the south side of Chicago. And I really wanted her to be able to talk about what had happened in the south side, about the policy I'm sure her family must have played, etc. So that's one of my tiny frustrations that I could never get through. I tried every which way sending mass because besides that, I think I got all the other interviews I wanted, but I never could get through. So if I could do it differently, I would get that interview. I just wanted to give you an actual answer. Sorry, I just had a second to think. On a practical level, what I'll do differently on my next film is, this is really boring documentary stuff, but we shot all of our interviews on location for my last film and it meant in every location we took the whole crew there, hired the gear there, set up a studio, did the interviews there. Definitely on my next film I'll set up a studio in one location and buy each interview subject an air ticket and a hotel room for the night because even though that sounds expensive it'd save a hell of a lot of money rather than doing that. I think there's like a, you know, like bring the mountain to Muhammad or bring Muhammad to the mountain. That's going to be on my wall with some things on my next film, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from our audience? Well, if if not, um, I would love to. How can we um, follow follow you as filmmakers, and what do you have potentially in the pipeline? Uh, yeah, you can follow uh, our film um, on all social channels uh, at the other fellow. Uh, my Instagram is at Matt Bow Film. Uh, and you can watch my film now on Amazon Prime Video, Tubi, Roku, um, if you search for it on a smart TV. Uh, yeah, you can find it there. Um, after this film festival, there's a few days, and um, then the uh, Mandel JCC Jewish Film Festival opens up for 10 days, and uh, there will be two showings of our film, one at the Maltz Museum, and also one at the Cedar Lee. Um, we are entering it in Israeli film festivals um, and um, uh, other Jewish film festivals across the country uh, is kind of our goal. Uh, so uh, hopefully, you know, like I think we all desire to have our film be seen and to uh, share the message that we've uh, so avidly worked at to try to obtain. So that's what's happening with, with this. And for the future, uh, uh, my focus isn't always, but in theater, uh, many times, uh, the focus is on Jewish-themed uh, theater and film. Uh, and so I have a few things happening and in the works. Um, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm on Inst. Instagram at Real Light Films and um, Monument, oh, uh, Real Light Films, R-E-A-L, Light Films, if anyone wants to be friends on there. And um, uh, Monument is on Facebook, too, if you guys watch it and want to um, talk more. But yeah, just thank you for having us here. This is awesome. So my documentary is actually showing this afternoon, 2 p.m. at the Valley Arts Center, um, just down the road from here. Uh, it'll also be available on the CDFF On Demand and on discovered.tv soon. Um, as to my next project, I'm working on a story about uh, how illegal gold mining is pulling away um, children from a village in Venezuela and this village happens to be situated next to the highest waterfall in the world and it's going to be a documentary about how this is microcosm of Venezuela is uh, part of the larger uh, problem that's happening in Venezuela and some of the more stronger social issues they have over there and I'm trying to get that off the ground as well so I'm looking for funding so if anyone has uh, deep pockets see me after the show well, my film is going to be screened tomorrow, so this is fantastic. And then I'm going to go to a few more festivals. But actually, I think it's much easier to do a film than to sell a film. So distribution is still a very big, mysterious enigma. 
uh, you know, you are approached by sales agents, etc. but you're not sure. So I don't know what will happen next, but uh, we'll see. Hopefully I'll get distribution and uh, it will be seen uh, also outside of the festivals. Um, sorry, I should mention too that Monument is actually playing tomorrow, so I will be there for Q&A, I'm not sure. I think it's like, what? 12.45 tomorrow. Yeah, I'll be there. Well, let's hear it one more time for our uh, panelists. And thank you so much for coming to the Chagrin Documentary Film Festival. Please stick around today. It sounds like some of our films are playing today and tomorrow. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.